Okay, Bob Mary. Um, that's his wife. Then uh, a little bit about, you're, you're from this area, you're a native. Born here. Born here. Born in a house, not a log cabin, but born in a house <laughs> in Jamestown, 69 Westcott Street. Oh. And what would you, your mom and dad do? Well, here, uh, uh, mom uh, and dad married very early in life. I, they were part of that uh, generation where the parents arranged the wedding. I'm sorry, the, the marriage. And the way that was accomplished was uh, back in those days, uh, Jamestown had uh, streetcars. And uh, uh, my uh, dad's parents had uh, come across my mother, liked her, and they said to my mother's parents, we got a nice a boy, you know, a nice <laughs> Italian boy, and uh, he'd like to meet your, your daughter. And so they arranged it so that my mother with her mother and her aunt got on the streetcar and uh, uh, they drove or rode about four blocks and then my dad with his father and mother got on the streetcar and they looked at one another my mother and dad and apparently liked what they saw <laughs> had another uh, contact on the streetcar later on and from that the uh, uh, marriage came about within about six months and uh, then uh, a year later, I was born, and that uh, my mother's occupation then, of course, was motherhood for a while. Uh, she then, uh, after, uh, after that at some point, she did work in the woolen mills in Jamestown. She went to work, I should back up, she actually went to work in the milling, in the mills uh, before she got married. Uh, her dad uh, encouraged her to quit school so that she could go back and earn some money and to bring some money into the, the family. And, uh, and it was after that that the, the marriage took place. Dad uh, worked on, uh, uh, they were on welfare for a while because uh, they happened to have hit bad economic times in this country at, uh, at that time. Dad uh, then went to work for the county highway department. He also worked in the city of Jamestown streets. And if you have traveled the brick streets of Jamestown, you'll probably see the fingerprints and thumbprint of my father on a lot of those bricks. And uh, uh, from there, he went to work at uh, some of the factories in town, Malleable Iron and Weber Knapp. He, uh, got me a job at Weber Knapp uh, during the summertime. So I got to see what this little guy, five foot three, uh, would do all day long. And that was to lug these hundred pound uh, molds into which they would pour uh, brass or whatever, aluminum or whatever uh, item that they were gonna make. They, um, then uh, uh, my dad, uh, wanted to have his own home, his own property. Uh, he happened to uh, uh, come across uh, some lots in Cottage Park in Lakewood, or just outside of Lakewood. And uh, he uh, actually won one of them. What they would do is wrap them off, 25 foot lots. And uh, you couldn't build a house on 25 feet, so you had to buy at least one, two, three, or four more. Well, after Dad got that one deed for the 25 feet, he found on the deed, uh, at the end of the deed, it said, this property shall not be sold to Polanders, Italians, Negroes, or other people of undesirable, yeah, undesirable background. That word isn't background, element, that was it. Because I still have a, a copy of the deed at home. So he went to an attorney, Sam Alessi, in Jamestown, and said, look, I can't build on this property because of this condition. Well, Sam Alessi told him that fortunately, the United States Supreme Court had ruled that those kinds of clauses were unconstitutional and unenforceable. What year? So, what year? What year? Uh, it was the late, part of the late 40s. Jackson was on the court then. Yeah. Right, yeah. And so uh, that was their, uh, their beginning. Uh, Dad built the house uh, 
uh, literally by hand back in the days when he didn't have the type of tools folks have now, um, built it literally, literally from the ground up. The house is still there, yeah, still there in Cottage Park. You're destined to be a lawyer? Not really. I, I, well, I must have been destined to be an attorney in one way, but I, when I went through high school, I wanted to be a football coach. I went to Denison University. And I, Woody Hayes was a coach there at that time. Uh, but I got hurt playing basketball, of all things, and uh, decided to better change my major. And my uncle, who later became a federal judge in uh, Georgia, um, uh, was an attorney, and I admired him, loved him very much, respected him, and I decided to follow his footsteps. He uh, served in World War II. He was uh, in the Air Force, and on one of his missions, uh, his uh, plane was shot down by the Germans uh, as they were. He was being shot, or the plane was being shot at. Uh, it caught fire. My uncle. Uh, uh, unbuckled his uh, uh, safety belts and uh, reached for the fire extinguisher and then the plane hit the water. Because he was reaching out for that fire extinguisher, he was thrown from the plane, uh, body broken in, uh, in his legs, uh, but uh, he was only one who survived out of that plane crash. All of his crew members died. Uh, I happened to go to the internet and uh, learned uh, about all of those uh, flights and that took place out of England and uh, his particular flight and it recited that he was a survivor. He was uh, rescued by some fishermen uh, but then uh, uh, the Germans, uh, when the fishermen reached shore, uh, the uh, Germans uh, uh, took my, fa uh, my uncle prisoner and he uh, was a prisoner of war for about three years. He made three attempts to escape. Uh, the last one <coughs> uh, uh, succeeded, and the way it succeeded was that the Germans had brought in some Italian uh, laborers to uh, work, and uh, uh, the uh, my uncle somehow figured out and. Maybe you'll read about it someday because a book is being written about his life. Uh, the, uh, uh, what he had done, my uncle, because he wanted to get out of there. He, and uh, I really should back up and tell you that uh, one of the first prisons he was at was the one where the Great Escape had its site. And he was participating in that whole methodology of uh, uh, a very sophisticated setup that these uh, guys had in order to uh, dig the tunnel and they'd figured out how far that tunnel ought to go and they had this uh, mechanism worked where they would, it would literally be some kind of a uh, kind of a blower system by hand in order to pump air into that area where the men uh, were working and uh, how they hid that uh, I really can't fathom other than what I saw in the movie. And uh, the, uh, they were getting to the point where this great event of the escape was to take place. And my uncle was transferred to another uh, prison, he and another group. It worked out to his fortune because, as you know, a lot of the guys were captured, shot. Uh, as an example of what uh, should not be done by prisoners of the German army. So he, uh, uh, in his third uh, uh, escape, what he did, because he wanted to get out of there, and uh, some of the uh, American soldiers, non-commissioned soldiers, uh, had been sent there as a work party too. And what he did was swap uh, his uh, dog tags with another um, with a, another soldier and uh, by the way the name of, of the soldier was uh, was Jewish and here my uncle's an Italian but he got by at least with 
those uh, uh, dog tags and credentials. He then uh, uh, managed to mingle in with the, uh, the Italian uh, workers and uh, through some process uh, got his way, made his way to Italy. And uh, he was there, kept uh, with the families there for a while, uh, and then managed to get to the Swiss, Swiss border through connections that the Italians had at that time. Uh, and uh, the Swiss were not wanting to let him in. Here he's an Italian, he came from Italy, and uh, they didn't believe that he was an American. And uh, he got very emotional about it, as some Italians can. And they finally, he convinced them to at least take him to a higher uh, official. That was done, it finally uh, determined that yes, he was an American. And <clears throat> at about that time, I'd say a couple months later, the war ended so he could come home. He's got quite a story. There's even more to it than that that I can tell you. But he's the, model, uh, the man that I admired and uh, wanted to follow uh, his path. Then you come back to Jamestown. First of all, where did you go to law school? Albany Law School. Albany Law School, a place which some other distinguished people never went to college, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've been hearing this for three years. <laughs> so another distinguished judge from Albany. Uh, they came back and were there any t other than a judge or other than a lessee? Were there any Italians for other practice here practicing in Jamestown? Oh, certainly, yeah. Tubi Scarpino and Mike Lombardo uh, were practitioners. Uh, Ross Spoto, mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, their uh, list of clientele, and they were good, outstanding, honest lawyers. And I was, uh, you know, proud to be associated uh, with them. So did you set up your own shingle or did you go on with another firm? No, I set up my own uh, shingle in uh, Lakewood and then I, uh, I became a partner with Bob Booty, uh, who goes back many years and his family does too. Uh, but Bob uh, didn't want to move to Lakewood, I didn't want to move to Jamestown, so we had separate offices and literally separate practices together. <laughs> but he, he kind of uh, was my guiding star uh, as I learn more of the practical side of the law practice. And from Booty, well, how'd you get interested in politics? Was, it, was that a, something you'd had during high school days, college days? When uh, I was growing up, uh, my dad gave me uh, two books. Uh, one was The Three Musketeers and the other one was A Boy's Book of Politics. And it was put together, I think, by the Christian Science Monitor Publishing. <coughs> And I was so impressed with it, uh, even at that age, I was about 12 at the time, I wanted to become the first Italian-American president of the United States. And I'm really on it. And uh, so I never made it, obviously. Uh, but uh, I had my interest in politics. Then uh, somehow one of our teachers took us to uh, Mayville, got a chance to see the uh, county building. And, uh, and I knew that someday I would run for Congress. I never did, but that was my dream and my aspiration. Um, so it, it had, the, the seeds had been planted there. My dad, who had never completed his education in, in Italy or Sicily uh, and never added to it here, was very interested in government. Mm -hmm. Made sure he voted every election would read uh, the newspapers, knew more about politics than a lot of the citizens who were born and raised here. We're going to pause for just a second because I got this. I'm going to show you something that was in my mother's car. It, you talk about serendipity. I was trying to figure out what it is that I could prompt, that I could prompt Judge Gerasi to talk about really the subject of what we want to talk about is learn a little bit about Shadok Khan because these folks mainly are transplants. And there's nobody more in tune than you. My mother's car, it is, I was driving around, and I had a flat tire. And so I was looking in her, her uh, uh, glove compartment. My mother has this Chautauqua County Highway Map, 
1958. I'm going to give this to Jeff to take a look at. And in it has county officials, list of county officials, Chautauqua County Board of Supervisors, something that doesn't exist today. And sure enough, what I believe is the only person still among us who's listed as a member of the Board of Supervisors is one Joseph Jurassic in Bostock. So as a, as a jumping off point, <laughs> thanks to my mother, after you and I talked, because I had no clue how we were going to jump into this, this is perfect. Uh, so. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Remember it well. Oh, yeah. Was this, what was there, was there a prelude politically to you becoming a uh, member of the Board of Supervisors? What, were, were there other offices that you had aspired to and won? Uh, the only office I had run for before running uh, for town supervisor was for school board. I, I really wanted to get on that school board, and I got beat, so never made it. Lost my first uh, election. Uh, the way I got to run for town supervisor was I, uh, I you know, I believed in the two-party system, and we only had one party running this county uh, for many, many years. And uh, so I, I did uh, uh, act as chair of the Democratic Committee for the town of Busti. And uh, what, the way we would uh, nominate our candidates would be at a caucus. Mm -hmm. And uh, at our caucus, uh, we ended up with about five people. And we needed to fill several slots. And uh, they convinced me. I had not, no intention to run at the time in 57, but they convinced me to run for town supervisor. And I thought I would at least uh, have my name uh, tossed in uh, the ring, but uh, I was trying to build up a law practice, and I didn't feel I'd have time to campaign. But the closer the election got, the more I felt, darn it all, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, just sit back, I'm going to get out there and work. And so for the first time in the history of bus die, they saw a candidate for office knocking on doors. And I covered uh, most of the town by knocking on doors. I even got the vote, I think, of the Republican town chairman because he was angry at the current <laughs> town supervisor. <laughs> you can't be an elected official without antagonizing some of the political structure that puts you where you are. So uh, I managed to be elected as town get? supervisor and got my name on the county highway map. <laughs> <laughs> Who did you beat? Uh, his name was Ekman, Emmett Ekman. He was a fine man, really. Uh, my, uh, you know, my concern uh, uh, was at that time, I mean, town government was run honestly, certainly, but my concern was uh, at the county level because the town supervisors at that time, there were 37 of us, but the town, uh, I'm sorry, I strike that. There were 27 town supervisors and there were an additional 10 supervisors from the cities. But the town supervisors not only served as the uh, executive for the town, they would also serve as a county supervisor. So they served two governments, town government, and county government. And uh, I, I just felt that uh, county uh, government uh, needed to pay more attention to uh, uh, all of the county rather than some of the rural area alone. And that's what caused me to campaign as hard as I did. And I was fortunate enough to win. Then uh, I, I served uh, for uh, a few terms, and then I got the cockamamie idea of running for state assembly. Because if anyone was angry with what the state was doing to upstate New York and Chautauqua County, uh, it was I. And uh, ran a vigorous campaign, and I lost that one. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm really grateful I did, because I, I don't think I would like the idea of having to live in in Albany, uh, uh, 
two days a week, three days a week, and do that uh, year after year after year. So that's how I got my start. Board of Supervisors, how did it operate? You, I see that there was a chairman, Al Clothier. Uh, was he a supervisor who was selected from among the, the members? As a practical matter, the, the majority party would pick the chair of the Board of Supervisors. From its, from its uh, yeah. there, there was not a hired gun, or not a manager, where they hired somebody to come in and manage the company? No, no, no. No, the uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, and, and particularly the chairman, uh, would see that uh, certain department heads were appointed. We had some department heads that were elected. Uh, the county treasurer, for example, was elected. County clerk was elected. County sheriff was elected. Uh, but other uh, officials, uh, uh, like finance director, uh, the clerk of the legislature, or the clerk of the Board of Supervisors, they were appointed by the board. The, at that time, the uh, board would, uh, as they do now, the legislature does now, uh, they would uh, have to approve a budget, and that budget would uh, translate into taxes uh, for the public. There were a couple of guys who were just been around forever, like County Treasurer Bob Miller and County Clerk Nathaniel Elliott. Just because they were was it the politics, or was it these sort of individuals who were there? They were both Republicans. Uh, was this backing up? Was this pretty much a, a dominant Republican county at the time? It was. Yeah. It was the. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were six Democrats on that 37-member. Board of Supervisors. The rest of them were obviously Republican, and uh, there were, we were all male. Uh, I think there were only there was only one woman that had been uh, elected as a supervisor, and I believe it was from the town of Poland. And uh, later on, there was a woman elected as a uh, county supervisor. Uh, I, I have to say at this point for history. Uh, the county was dominated by the Republicans, no question about it. Uh, but I don't think you could find a more honest bunch of people, unless they were Democrats, but, but seriously, <laughs> they were honest men, they were good men, they were decent men, and they did love their county. We had uh, violent disagreements on some issues. Uh, Newton Memorial Hospital is a good example. Uh, some of you may remember the Newton Memorial uh, Hospital. It was a TB hospital. At, uh, and uh, oh, Where was that? The county, Casadega. Casadega, okay, find the hill. Yeah. And so we had bitter battles about that. We had bi bitter fights about the sales tax and had differences of opinion there. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were good and decent people. At some point, there is a conversation that ultimately leads to a different form of government. Tell us about that. Well, the uh, United States Supreme Court uh, had determined in a case that I should recall the name of, uh, and I don't right now, but may come to me, but uh, they determined that uh, in our country, in order to have a, uh, as perfect a democracy as you possibly can, or humanly can get, uh, that we should adopt the principle of one man, one vote, or one woman, one vote. And that would be to equalize the, the voting capability that each of us had. And uh, when uh, uh, I learned of that ruling, tried to get the county to uh, adopt a form of a government that would respond to it, and they refused to do it, they being the Republicans that were in power at the time. And uh, so Dr. Glenn Ebersol, I, Ebersol lived in Lakewood. He was a radiologist and a real decent citizen, uh, uh, like you, active in many uh, parts of uh, uh, community activities from supporting the theater, supporting the uh, um, high school, supporting uh, any of the positive things happening. But he was concerned too. So he and I joined uh, in a lawsuit against the county. Now at that time, 
uh, you recall in my other history, I told you that I had run for assembly and then not made it, so for a couple of years I was out of government. So as a citizen, uh, I joined with him to sue the county to reapportion it in such a way that uh, every one of us would have an equal vote, whether we came from Chautauqua, Busti, uh, City of Jamestown, because uh, our situation was this. The uh, town of uh, Busti had 8,000 people. The supervisor had one vote on the board. The uh, town of uh, Pomfret uh, had about 12,000 people. The supervisor had one vote. The supervisor of the town of Arkwright, population 854, had one vote. And so there were several rural towns that had fewer than 1,500 people. Their supervisors each had one vote. So uh, we, uh, the lawsuit uh, sl slodged along, but uh, uh, in the meantime, the county uh, did develop a uh, weighted voting. As a matter of fact, Fred Cusimano, who was a, a city supervisor, city of Jamestown, attempted the, to get the board uh, to adopt a weighted vote so that uh, we would still have 37 supervisors. Each of them, however, would have a vote that was uh, proportionate to the population that each represented. Uh, the county rejected that. Um, that is the Board of Supervisors. So um, uh, by the time the case did get to the judge, after a lot of motions were made and plans were submitted and um, the, the legal process dragged along, I got elected again as supervisor of the town. So I not only was a plaintiff in the lawsuit, I ended up being a defendant in the same lawsuit because I was suing the county. Uh, no one ever you know, felt there was a conflict of interest at that time, but it was kind of amusing. Uh, the upshot was that uh, uh, we had uh, appointed some commissions and the like. They did work out a 25-member legislative district that they thought would be appropriate. In the meantime, the judge had ordered this weighted voting. So one supervisor might have 400 votes, another one might only have you know, 30. Uh, and then uh, for each measure where someone called for a roll call vote, uh, you'd find that the clerk would have to tally all of these, all of these numbers. Uh, no one really liked that setup, but uh, it, it served us all right for a while. But we ended up then um, with a plan where we would end up with a 25-member legislative district and that the supervisors uh, that would be elected thereafter would merely serve as town supervisors and no longer represent the county. How long did that take? Give, give me a, a two years, five years? to go from a, uh, a board of supervisors, then you go into the litigation phase, and ultimately ends up with 25 legislators. I'd say about three years, maybe four if you wanted to add uh, uh, a year or two that the commissions uh, came up with several different plans that they would submit to the, to the court. And, and did they, uh, uh, well, let's talk about that. And then that's sort of the legislative part of government. And the executive part had been run by the chairman of the board of supervisors. So at some point, there's a decision to have a, a separate election for the county executive. But before that, uh, we did end up with this 25-member legislative body. And the chair of that legislature would be the literally the executive. Uh, and uh, uh, what had happened, uh, in uh, about two elections after that, uh, the Democrats ended up with a majority of the members of the legislature. And uh, I became chairman of the legislature at that time. Uh, there had been uh, several uh, surveys, if you will, of how the people felt about what kind of an administrator they wanted. Did they want to have the uh, legislative body appoint a county administrator or did they want to elect their county executive? 
Uh, I personally favored the elected executive system, um, and so did a majority of the public because we had a referendum, and uh, we adopted a charter, and the charter called for an elected county executive. And then I ran uh, as the and became elected as the first county executive in the county. You started off as a legis as a supervisor, and you were one of six Democrats. Not so soon thereafter, there was a Democratic majority. What happened? Uh, of the legislature. legislature. Yeah, there was. I mean, One of the things that happened thing. was uh, a significant thing was that the town of Ellicott decided to do a revaluation of its uh, real estate, of its property for tax purposes. And uh, they, they had a few uh, uh, secret meetings, I guess, but um, the supervisor became very unpopular. And as a result, he was ousted out of office. And as a result of that, the uh, uh, Democrats ended up with a majority on the county legislature. Just county-wise, though, it was a pretty significant shift from your early days, where it's you're six out of 37, and now all of a sudden you even have, you have a majority. Did you get a shift? Was it just uh, away from the Republicans towards the Democrats, or was it just young people? Did you get a sense of what was going on? Well, was it, well, there was a uh, the the number of thirty uh, seven and only six Democrats stemmed from the fact that uh, the Democrats were being elected from the city, uh, and uh, the Republicans elected uh, primarily from the rural area. Uh, in creating the 25-member uh, district, you then uh, spread the population a little more evenly, if you will, uh, in the districts that were uh, represented by the uh, uh, legislators. So I, I don't think there was anything really dramatic. Uh, I think the sales tax issue had something to do with reapportionment. Uh, uh, gave uh, more power, if you will, to the legislators from the uh, populated areas. And all of that added up to what uh, Gordon Anderson, who was the chairman of the legislature at some point when I was county executive, uh, described as the revolution. And it was a revolution because it literally changed county government from this 37-member board of supervisors to an executive and a, a legislative uh, body. And uh, because of the, the fact that uh, there was m more uh, influence, if you will, from the populated areas, uh, we then uh, were able to address some issues like Chautauqua Lake. Uh, some of you may not remember, but Chautauqua Lake was such where Jesus could have walked across the waters uh, because of all of the silt and the uh, and uh, weeds and the like that were on top of the, the waters. And uh, we had sewerage running down. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in my lovely village of uh, Lakewood, uh, during a heavy, heavy rainstorm, um, the uh, storm sewers, uh, well, the, the sewer lines, rather, uh, literally got filled with water, so full of water that if you went down to the beach in Lakewood, you could see the, the manhole cover being lifted by the force of the water coming down the hill and all this beautiful refuse going right into Chautauqua Lake. And so there was a, a, a real focus on Chautauqua Lake and a focus on the sewers, a focus on uh, uh, trying to clean up the lake. And it was a, it was a really tough battle, I've got to tell you. We, uh, my wife can vouch for the fact we got some pretty nasty phone calls by people who didn't like the idea of a new tax for sewers only. Uh, but we did manage to uh, get a sewer uh, in southern Chautauqua County and eventually in areas in the north as well. What time period are we talking about now? 
Uh, let's see. I knew I should have written uh, uh, those dates down, but it would have been in, well, the after 1970. The, uh, oh, wow. 1970. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The... Uh, uh, sewer. The legislature was created earlier than that. I mean. Yes. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah, when you talk about the dates. I thought you were referring to the sewer. Yeah. Uh, sewer yeah. issues. Yeah. The uh, yeah the legislative uh, body. I, I remember it would have been about 1972 that we oh. were involved with that. That I became uh, chair of the legislature. And I think when you harken back, uh, that is such a significant part of the salvation of the county, is the diamond, the lake. I mean, we continue to struggle with it. Obviously, it's a focus quite a bit. But without that South Center sewer district and the other related sewer districts, and you hope for the day when the whole lake has got it, it's, it's, it's getting closer. Uh, but that is really significant. Now, today, in 2008, you don't think about it. It's like it's been there forever. That's right. Uh, yeah, in fact, I was talking to uh, one of the county legislators uh, four years ago. He was a transplant from Erie County. And uh, he never knew that we had this big problem of sewers or lack of sewers or lack of appropriate sewers in southern Chautauqua County. And uh, I had to educate him on the history of the sewer district. But that was it. The other big thing that we did, uh, uh, we had 45 open dumps in Chautauqua County. I don't know if some of you remember, if you ever went by uh, on Washington Avenue, you could kind of look to your left as you were going out of town and you could see uh, flame smoke from the dump that was there. And there were dumps like that throughout all of the county, 45 of them. And that was another difficult time uh, for me and my family and the elected officials uh, because uh, we decided that uh, we tired of that. We were going to adopt a different system of taking care of our waste. And uh, of course then the big problem became where were we going to uh, land this uh, receptive facility for all of the garbage of Chautauqua County? And uh, would you believe one of the spots that some of the folks had picked out was the town of Busti, where I was, <laughs> I was from. <laughs> I don't know who had that idea, but we, we went through it. We had an environmental study, and uh, lucky for me, the, uh, the uh, folks doing the study found there's an awful lot of groundwater underneath that would have had to, uh, we'd had to pay attention to. So we did finally find an ideal, what was considered an ideal site by uh, everybody except the poor folks uh, that voted for <laughs> Gordon Anderson because it ended up in his district. And it wasn't because he was Republican, it just happened to be of all the sites that were tested, that was the, the best site. So we finally ended up where all of our garbage were going in one place. I remember going to the city of Dunkirk and they, they had a big mound there and rats and rat traps and uh, I remember having a hearing up, up there before we decided where what we were going to do with the garbage and uh, I'm sitting at a table like this and an irate guy comes up with a plastic bag with a rat in it and dumped it on the table and he said this is what we've got up here and we don't want it anymore. Well, neither did I. We can remember going up on Fire Road to look at the bears through the stuff. Oh. So where was, where was this final dump site where Mr. Anderson Town of Ellery, yeah. that area. It's yeah. not going to be converted into energy supplying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did a lot of work in trying to find alternatives to dispose of this, you know, and we, we had. Uh, invited scientists and what have you, but the, the least expensive way and the best way that we could work out was the, the landfill. Uh, Bill Parment, who was my director of public works, played a vital part in not only the landfill, uh, but also in the sewer project. The sewer project uh, was being run by some sewer boards and they had hired engineers 
engineers uh, had uh, misunderstood because they didn't do adequate studies of the soil where the sewer was to go. And uh, at the, uh, once they started the sewer project, uh, instead of being able to have the lines go uh, be built down about 24 feet uh, below the surface of the earth in some areas, they would have had to go 48 feet. It, it just uh, tripled the cost. In fact, if quadrupled uh, comes to my mind, it's because it was probably close to that too. And so those citizens who were trying to run this operation of building sewers and the like, um, we, you know, they're part-timers. And so the uh, board decided to turn that over to the county executive. So Bill Parman and I had the fun job of trying to take care of uh, uh, the sewers. We did sue the engineers and managed to get some money there that helped pay for the cost of the so you see, I spent most of my time in court as, <laughs> as a county executive. But I had some fine people too, and Bill Parment was uh, one of my stars, and Dave Dawson was one of my other stars, uh, and what resulted from that connection uh, was uh, we were able to bring Cummins Engine to Chautauqua County. And that to me was one of the gold pieces uh, uh, that I claim as part of, well, whatever legacy there is for Jurassic, was getting Cummins Engine here, a good, responsible, good paying, high paying company, quality people, and uh, who had a philosophy that I wish maybe Ford had had, and uh, G General Motors, and uh, some other company by the name of Chrysler. But there, where what impressed me the most was, because uh, I visited their outfit in uh, Columbus. Indiana, and uh, what they would do though, they, they would have teams of people that would work different sections, different operations, and those teams would literally determine uh, who was going to uh, be the lead person of the team, but they would resolve all the issues and take care of uh, what needed to be done in order to get a good product out. There's a great teamwork approach. and. Uh, I said, I wish our three auto companies had adopted that a long time ago. There, in 1958, according to my mother's map, the population of Chautauqua County was 135,000. Today, I think it's about 135,000. The question that comes up, and I've heard it from the peanut gallery over here, is why do we have so many, why do we have 25 legislators? We had 25 legislators kind of with back then. Should we have continued to have 25 legislators? Uh, having lived through all that, do you get a sense of that one man, one vote argument that you hear about? Well, uh, the, the big debate between the small group, I mean, there's a county like uh, Suffolk County that's got you know millions of people, million and a half maybe. Uh, they only have three supervisors. Now, the one advantage here, if you want to call it that, is that John and Jane Q. Citizen could become part of county government on a part-time basis with the 25 or 37 or 20. Uh, if, you, if you reduce it to, say, 10, 6, 3, those folks are going to be full-time. Will it be cheaper? Uh, I don't think so. Will it be more efficient? Probably. So it's just a, a question of whether or not you want a system where the average person can play a part like you do here at Chautauqua uh, without having to uh, uh, run for a full-time office. The other big issue is whether or not county manager might be more efficient than county executive. Uh, one of my concerns has been that uh, uh, it's now costing, or at least they're spending, the candidates that run for county executive are spending like $175,000 to run for county executive. And uh, uh, I, I have to admit that if I was to do it over, uh, I might have given deeper thought to uh, having a county manager 
uh, one of the best run counties in the state of New York is Schenectady County and they've had a county manager system and had the same guy in office all the time that I was in politics, about 25 years, Bob McAvoy. Uh, and uh, they had issues as severe as we did here. But uh, I happen to believe in, in uh, you know, in having folks have the right to elect their uh, leaders. So I guess I would, even after all these years, end up still supporting the elected approach, even though that I know it's got problems. If you were county executive today, what would you see would be the direction of Chautauqua County 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now? Well, I think I'd like to hear it from the peanut gallery as to what well, they'd like to see. Will. But Oh, will they? Oh, all right. Yeah. yeah I, I'll just start. <laughs> I, all right. Um, when I... Uh, when I was running for office, uh, I firmly believed that uh, we really needed to have a, a, a very aggressive effort to try to have more tourism and uh, more population and uh, have this county grow in that fashion. But I've also, during the years, seen the pain of that kind of growth and uh, the negative results of too fast a growth, too overpowering a growth. So I wouldn't work against that as a county executive, um, but I, I, I would try to maintain pretty much what we have uh, and work on uh, at least supporting the industries that are here, supporting the businesses that are here, trying to help the smaller businesses because that are being swallowed up by you know, the big uh, retail outfits and big businesses. Uh, but I wouldn't uh, be working toward as dramatic a, a change as I thought about when I was uh, 40 years old. Questions for Judge Jurassic? There, There is a um, long-range plan being commissioned that has just been uh, established first one since 1977, I believe. Have, have you um, kept track of what their goals and ambitions are? And no, uh, once I became a judge, I, I really distanced myself as much as I could from uh, government, from politics, other than issues that would come before me. So I, I've not gotten into, uh, uh, into that at all. Into that. Well, what do you see? Uh, I, I see a commission that is uh, peopled by very dedicated and good people who have leveraged the money that the county has given them into about four times about that money through grants and other things. I see um, a person who has been hired by that commission and the county, who is a developer, but a developer who thinks way, way outside the box. He is not doing great yeah. kinds of things, but he's saying that lake needs to be protected and those mm -hmm. woods need to stay there. And okay, what does this community want? And he does surveys, his name is Randall Arndt, and, and he is, he is, yeah. he is a very positive person, and I think by hiring him, and he's trying to get a sense of community that, that Chautauqua County will be um, looking at a development that is what the community itself wants. Okay, well, I, I don't see any problem with it. I, I uh, with, with that, I, I know that uh, to follow up on the question you asked, uh, you know, I would work very hard to restore uh, any deficiencies that we've had in, in our environment, in our lakes, uh, in our community. Um, I would uh, also, 
I would also work uh, even more vigorously than I did uh, to uh, uh, work on the state legis or in a, yeah the state legislature and the governor uh, to stop uh, preaching about uh, uh, education and really doing something about uh, education about every campaign that I've uh, been a part of or heard or witnessed uh, somebody pops up with you know I'm all for education and uh, then when it comes time to really get involved to support it and I don't mean just with dollars um, I, I also mean with giving the mechanism for uh, if we wanted to in Chautauqua County for example uh, kind of consolidate the administration of uh, the schools as they have in Pennsylvania. They'll have you know, one superintendent for the entire county and uh, uh, managing all of, uh, of the schools. Uh, I do the same thing with the local governments, attempt to work in that, in that way to you know, consolidate the effort. But where I would work the hardest would be to try to get the state government to change what it does to local governments. And my, the example is uh, the courts and the jail. The legislature of the state didn't determine directly that we had to spend that kind of money, but they delegated to commissions like the Crime Commission and uh, uh, other commissions. And they're the ones that make the decision. So the legislature can, their, their legislative candidates can pontificate all they want about, oh, I'm against mandates, I'm against. But every, every time they come up with some legislation that needs some work at the local level and money at the local level, they then delegate it to a group of non-elected people that make the decisions. And that's what happened at, my, at the jail up there. We have a much more elaborate jail. Uh, I know that my son, the sheriff, uh, um, had uh, an interest in maybe a, a double bunking, and we did that for quite a while while we had a space problem. But uh, the state wouldn't allow that forever. Uh, no double bunking. Well, you know, these are not prisoners that are going to be there five years. They're, they're only there at most, if they're sentenced, no more than a year. Uh, and some of them there for less time. And double bunking would have kept the cost down. Um, the, and I, I hope I'm not misunderstood by this, um, but the prisoners there have about the best medical response in the county, even better than, you know, folks at Chautauqua or Lakewood, uh, because the sheriff has the obligation to see that uh, they have that medical uh, attention. But uh, uh, there are ways to deliver that service uh, at a lower cost. but can't do that. You've got to follow the edicts of the commission. So everything that they do, the guards, the sheriff, what have you, in terms of the jail facilities or how to handle the prisoners is controlled by some folks in Albany, and they're tough. Which has nothing to do with what goes on in Chautauqua, it's, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. Hey, Judge, we had heard uh, young ago, your son talked to the sheriff, talk about the multiple kinds of prisoners, just informally we will be mentioning this, but he was trying to get the information out. The multiple kinds of prisoners that he had to entertain over here, uh, federal, state, transfer, right. uh, market, program, and he had, they were dumped on him. He, but had, they can't to, he had to respond. And they can't co-mingle them. No, no, no. And he said it was a, a, a great geometry problem in trying to figure out how to keep all these various legal types of prisoner uh, cared for and the associations had to be yeah. cared for. One advantage to the federal prisoners uh, are, is that uh, the federal government pays us and pays us uh, appropriately. Uh, the state uh, isn't that generous when it comes to a state prisoner. Uh, they don't pay as much as the federals do, but the if, if federal I, prisoners help pay for the jail operation. If I remember correctly, Joe said, your son Joe, said that there, if you throw in male and female prisoners, there are 14 different yeah. categories of prisoners housed there, and they cannot mix any of them together. Yes. In other words, those who have been sentenced to a year for local 
violations can't be mixed with those who are waiting trial for a misdemeanor mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, his organization chart is, a, is a, just a mass of requirements. That's right. And, and the legislators have nothing to do with it. Now, they put that power in the hands of just about, I think it was five people on that uh, commission. And uh, Stan Lundin, who's working on you know, local government efficiency, uh, has focused on that as well. Uh, and he pointed out to one of the counties down east where um, instead of uh, consolidating a couple of jails from in two different counties into one, uh, they forced, the commission said, no, you gotta have your own jail. $50 million is going to be spent in that community for a jail facility. And i got to tell you, it'll be, well, I wouldn't want to live there, but it'll be the... Committing a crime? Yeah. No. No, I wouldn't want to be in, the, in that setup. But anyway, that, they're the ones that are making the decisions, and uh, uh, that needs to be changed. Needs to be changed. Otherwise, we're just going to be continue to be crucified We'll re with real property taxes. Well, isn't it true that the Fox is in the chicken house in Albany? But, uh, we have one of the most expensive states in the Union. If Connecticut would get out of the way, we would be the most expensive state in the Union in which to live. And we, everybody who lives in New York State recognizes this, number one. And we all feel powerless to do anything about it. Throw the bums out, but it doesn't work because we elect another bum. <laughs> well, no, uh, the statistic or er, uh, uh, history has proven that while folks curse the state legislature, they'll curse Congress. They love their legislator and the Congress person. That individual. Yeah, yeah. it is because, right. and one of the way reasons is. They've got all these goodies that they hand out, you know, see the name of the paper, giving something to this outfit and to that outfit. And, to that. and what they're giving is tax money. And for every 100000 that might be given, and I'm not knocking what's being given here, believe me, because some of it has benefited, uh, um, I'm sure, the Jackson Center and the theater and things that I love very much. But for every 100000 spent here, you can expect a million for the same kind of area uh, activity out of New York City. So, I have a question. Yes. I want to get away from this local thing and ask you, as a, ju as a judge, what about mandatory sentencing? How did you feel about having to... I don't like it. I uh, know. I don't, I don't like it. I think it's wrong. Thoughts? Because that comes from on high. What yeah. Your thoughts? How do we go about reversing that, which seemed like a very good idea 20 years ago or whatever? Well, we need to try to pin down our legislators. Uh, and by legislators, I mean uh, Congress folks, because they're the ones that put in place, uh, Democrats and Republicans alike, uh, put in place this uh, mandatory sentence and take it out of the hands of the judges. Yeah. And while judges aren't perfect, I know we're not perfect, uh, I'd still rather have the judge make the decision based on the case in front of the judge. So how do, we, what do, you, how do you go about changing you gotta, Well, you have to make an issue. This group here might even be the nucleus if you want to pick on that issue to uh, uh, try to uh, focus on having the Congress person uh, pursue that. I mean, there's so many issues now, I know that that's the last one that they would think about, but it, it does need someone to agitate for it. What's the legacy of Judge Jirasi? I don't know. I, 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 the most important uh, legacy, I guess, is that I, I've got I've got a good family. I'm so proud of uh, uh, my son Joe, the sheriff, and the dedication he shows not only to his children, a family of seven children, but uh, uh, to to uh, his, sh his sheriff's position. He's he's had uh, uh, offers of uh, jobs that would pay a third again as much, and uh, he turned it down to uh, 
continue on as sheriff. My daughter Andrea, who's uh, devoted her uh, quite a bit of her uh, life lately to uh, the arts. She's uh, with the Arts Council. She will soon, uh, and this isn't going to be published, uh, I assume, that's good. She'll soon be uh, uh, moving uh, over to uh, work under uh, John Marino at the Gebbie Foundation. And uh, so, uh, and then my other son, uh, Vincent, who was hired a long time ago by uh, Bentley, Sheriff Bentley, uh, to be the uh, head of the crime uh, uh, group in uh, the Sheriff's Department. And he's done an incredible job. I, uh, w one of the things I'm the proudest of uh, was the uh, crime that took place in the town of Busti when a couple of guys uh, uh, waved down this Pennsylvania young man who had, whose wife had just given birth to a beautiful little girl. And he's on his ho way home on a snowy night. And uh, these two guys uh, had run their vehicle off the road, and so he stopped to assist them. I don't know what happened between the stop and the end, except to know that they clubbed him to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was still snowing. Fortunately, somehow the call came into the Sheriff's Department so that Vincent and his team got out there and they were able to um, uh, reproduce the footprints and preserve the footprints that were there in the snow. And those footprints helped convict those two guys that are now serving time for the murder of that uh, young man. So it's that kind of thing that he's, he's done. And so my legacy is to have three children, uh, thanks to my good wife, Mary. Uh, that, to me, is the most important legacy. Politically, uh, all the other things have brought me great pleasure. And uh, uh, my legacy uh, is, in part, the lake, the sewer district, the <laughs> landfills, the airport, uh, uh, the bridge across Chautauqua Lake, that was uh, another big battle that, uh, that we fought. So uh, it was pretty well covered by the revolution described by uh, Gordon Anderson in his book. Uh, there was a revolution then by this change of government, and I don't know if that revolution